this morning, Maddie? I'm good, how are you? I'm well, thank you. So welcome everybody. I'm Heather, I am the nurse scientist, and today with me is Maddie, and she is the program coordinator for evidence-based practice. And what are we gonna talk about today, Maddie? Um, well, as my role as the evidence-based practice program coordinator in the Center for Nursing Inquiry, we spend a lot of time not just talking about evidence-based practice, but also quality improvement and research. So we're going to take a little time this morning to really talk about the difference between the three and then give some examples as well as, you know, why it matters. Oh, that sounds great. I know that that can cause a lot of confusion for people as to which types are what. So I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks. Um, so like I said, this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to really talk about some core definitions. Um, we're talking about them pretty high level, but you're going to have um, access to these slides later in case you want to read, you know, for your bedtime reading. Um, and then we'll sort of compare and contrast the three types as well as give a concrete example that might help sort of solidify the ideas. Um, so I did want to mention we talk a lot, we use a lot of acronyms in all of nursing. Um, and so I just wanted to say from the very start so I don't confuse anybody. Um, at, when I say EBP, I'm referring to evidence-based practice, and then when I say QI, I'm referring to quality improvement. Um, so we just have some other uh, abbreviations in there, which I realize I don't even, I don't even know what they all mean. So <laughs> I, even though I'm a millennial, I'm not quite that up to date, I guess. Um, okay, so let's get started. So we have the three forms of nursing inquiry. Um, I think maybe people have seen this uh, figure or this idea before where they're really, they're all created equal. They're the pegs of a stool, and if one of them is um, out of balance or if it's shorter, the whole stool is going to be wobbly. So you really want to be holding up all three legs, all three pillars of nursing inquiry, which are EVP, research, and QI um, equally. Uh, so like I said, we're going to talk a couple, uh, for a minute about just the core concepts of what the three things are and their definitions. Um, and these, uh, these definitions are actually taken from the Johns Hopkins Evidence-Based Practice Modeling Guidelines book. Um, so they're longer definitions. Like I said, we're not going to necessarily read them word for word, um, but you'll have access to them after the presentation. Um, but the things I wanted to point out were sort of like the key words that I really like to look at that help to solidify the ideas in my mind. Um, so evidence-based practice is a problem-solving approach that's looking at best available evidence. So basically what already exists out there and what, what's the best of the best. Um, whereas quality improvement is really a local process, so it's happening on your unit, in your department, um, and the idea is you really want to be improving outcomes or processes. And then finally, research. Research is very systematic. You make a plan, you follow that plan to a T, and the whole idea of research is to create new knowledge um, that can be generalized to a bigger population. So like I said, those are just some of the high-level ideas related to the three ideas three concepts. So evidence-based practices, what does the evidence tell us? So what information already exists and what's the overall messaging of that evidence as well as the quality of that evidence? Quality improvement is we know what works, so now let's make it work for us. And then research is there's not enough evidence for us, so let's try something new and see if it works and see maybe what it tells us. And an important thing to remember with research is there might be research out there related to your clinical problem but it might be in a different setting or it might be in a different population that might not necessarily be applicable to the group that you're working with. So for example, if there's a lot of information about falls in orthopedics patients, that information might not necessarily be transferable to a, a geriatric psychiatry clinic. And so therefore you might have to delve back into the evidence or maybe even answer a new question, a research question. Um, likewise, setting can matter. So there's you know, a lot of information about doing HIV testing in South Africa but that information might not necessarily um, be transferable to uh, urban academic setting in the United States. So again, looking to see what information exists, but then also is that information applicable to who you are working with? And that might lead you down a different route, whether it's research, EBP, or QI. I have a question, Maddie, about EBP. So I feel like um, as a clinician, as a bedside nurse, when I was a clinician, EBP was just what I did, like every day I did evidence-based practice. So when you talk about doing EBP as a, as a form of inquiry, how is that different than like me doing EBP as part of my practice? 
That's a really good question. So an EBP is so ingrained in practice, and yet when you hear it all the time, evidence-based medicine, evidence-based guidelines, evidence-based practice. So when we refer to it in the inquiry world, we're really talking about the evidence-based practice process or a project. So the, it's the whole process of identifying a problem, creating a clinical question, and then going to the evidence. So you're really, you're the one that's seeking out the information and um, doing a literature search and then appraising that evidence to decide how strong it is and if you want to make a practice change based on that evidence and how it might apply to your setting. So every day we're doing practices that are evidence-based, but an evidence-based practice process or project is actually the whole, is the idea of identifying those practices. So I think if you think of your own clinical practice as a practice that's evidence-based versus an evidence-based practice, that might be a way to sort of think about them differently. Oh, that's very helpful. And I guess it's because sometimes practice, well, often practice changes. So what was best practice 20 years ago may not be best practice today, right? Exactly. Um, I think a lot of us have now heard that statistic that it takes 17 years for best practice to be actually ingrained into daily clinical care. And so an evidence-based practice project is really trying to speed up that process by proactively going to the evidence saying, we, we've been doing this for a while, is this the best thing to be doing? And challenging um, sort of the status quo or what you consider to be the, the normal, and then um, changing uh, what your daily practice is based on the newest best evidence. And the evidence-based practice process tells you how to do that. Thank you for that. Um, so I know that people get these three things really confused. Um, even within our group, sometimes we have to have a conversation to figure out exactly where we land in these three buckets. Um, but I just, just wanted to say that, mention that I think about evidence-based practice is what do we already know? You're going to the literature, what information already exists? And then once you go to the literature and you establish what the best practice is, that turns into a quality improvement approach. So we know what we know, now what do we do with it? And then research itself is we have gone to the literature, this information isn't what doesn't already exist, and so we want to create something new. So it's what we know, now what do we do with it? And maybe we need something new. Oh, that's a nice, um, easy way to help remember the three different types. Yeah, the, the um, alliteration can sometimes make things a little easier. No, now new. I like it. <laughs> we just have to keep them straight. Um, so as we talked about sort of the core definitions, but now I want to talk a little bit about once you do one of these projects, like what's the end result? What are you holding in your hands to say, look, we did this project. Um, this is what we came up with. So for an evidence-based practice project, you're doing a synthesis of best practice, which um, generates best practice recommendations and then a translation to your practice setting. Whereas quality improvement, the word outcomes is a little bit maybe misleading because really quality improvement is a cyclical process that never really ends. So the idea is that you're gonna have an improvement on an identified metric that's gonna have ongoing monitoring. Hopefully eventually, once you've really established that it's taken hold, you can step back a little bit from your monitoring plan, but really it's, again, it's a cyclical process. You're continually making sure that you've really established the change, sustain the change. So although there's, there are outcomes related to your metrics, you're never really done. And then finally, with research, that's really, at the end, you're hoping to have new knowledge that you can uh, generalize to a bigger setting. Do you have, um, oh, you're going to talk about tools, so that might help me. But I guess once you're done with tools, maybe you can provide some examples of the different kinds. Yeah, for sure. I think Do you have any examples of like an evidence-based practice or a QI project that would help guide people through them? Yeah, for sure. I think that having like a really specific example and sort of thinking about it in three different ways can help solidify the idea in your mind. So we're going to talk about that um, sort of towards our, the end. Okay. But I did, I did want to mention that these three things can seem a little bit scary or foreign to people, but we want to make sure that everyone's aware that there are tools to do the projects. So um, at Johns Hopkins Hospital and Health System, we um, use the, the Johns Hopkins Evidence-Based Practice Model and Guidelines, which is this beautiful blue book that I think a lot of people have seen, maybe even back in nursing school. So the, mo the book itself is really almost like a manual or instructions about how to do an evidence-based practice project. 
And then there's the all important, um, people refer to them as the appendices usually, but they're really tools at the end of the book that are used for each step of the evidence-based practice project, the PET process, which is um, your practice question, evidence, and translation. And these are used to walk you through every single step, ask you really important questions to sort of guide you on to where, to where you're gonna end up at the end. So it's very prescriptive about each step you can take. I think tools are super important. They really help, um, they help structure your process so that you're not disorganized and all over the place. Yeah, for sure. Um, then we have quality improvement, and there isn't necessarily one go-to um, tool for quality improvement. There's actually lots of different ones. There's the plan, do, study, act cycle. There's Lean Sigma. There's Six Sigma. Um, Six Sigma for I think it's Lean Sigma for healthcare is through the institute or from the Armstrong Institute. So again, these are just different ways to structure your intervention and make sure you're really um, planning appropriately, collecting appropriate information, and then acting on that information. So I do think we use the plan, do, study, act cycle here a lot at Hopkins. Um, and actually, just interestingly, uh, quality improvement, the Six Sigma and Lean Sigma models, they actually came from um, automotive um, factories. And they were basically saying, well, we have a person who's uh, standing on the assembly line and they have to take this part and turn around and put it on this conveyor belt. And even though that adds just one second to their day, they're doing that a thousand times a day. So that's a thousand seconds. Is there something we can do to shorten that? And so maybe instead of having to turn around to put something on the conveyor belt, they're only, they have to just move it over. And so these little pieces identifying where the problem is and where things can be improved, that came from factories really. And now it's being applied to all different types of settings. It makes sense. We all want to save the time that we have. Yeah, and I think about that a lot like with nursing in that, you know, if you're standing next to the Pixis and you're pulling out medicines, do you have to go to another room to get tubing to spike the bag or is the tubing right next to the Pixis? So even just little things like that can really make a big difference in our daily workflows um, and are really all part of quality improvement initiatives. That's a great example. Um, and then finally, research itself is, um, again, it's a very prescriptive, very um, rigorous methodology where you make a plan and you're sticking to it. And there's a, kind of a whole can of worms in terms of opening up the research project, but I just wanted to mention that it does follow a scientific method. There's tons of different types of research. There can be randomized control trials, um, experimental, non-experimental, qualitative. And then all of your tools that you're going to use or the models you're going to follow are going to be based on what type of study you're doing. So here's just an example of um, a randomized control trial methodology um, and then some qualitative research methodology. Uh, but like I said, that those are, we could do a whole talk about those. So I just wanted to mention that there, is, there are tools that exist. And if you want more information, we're always here to support you um, if you would like to learn more about research methodologies. Um, so I know we're coming up on the last minute here, so I just wanted to um, get to your example, Heather. Oh, thank you. I really do like <laughs> examples. Examples are very helpful. Um, yeah. So uh, this one is the one I like to walk through, and it's basically, um, we're going to talk about one problem, and that's patient falls. I think we've all talked about that sort of, um, we're all very well aware that we don't want our patients to fall, and that it's sort of an ongoing, continuing problem. Um, so how do you make that a different EBP, QI, or research project? So we, might, we have our clinical problem, which is our patients are falling, we've created a PICO question, and we go to the evidence and we say, what evidence exists about um, patient falls in our population that could help us direct us to breast practice? So you go and you read all the evidence, you appraise it, and the evidence really says, whoops, that non-slip socks, that is what matters. We want people to wear non-slip socks. So now that you have established what the best evidence is, you're gonna move on to actually implementing it. And that's when it becomes a quality improvement project. So how do you get these darn socks on the people? People get hot, their socks are too small. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but like the XXLs would fit like a size nine women's shoe. So mm -hmm. like you have the right size socks. Right, um, so they take them off, they lose right. them. <laughs> So how do you actually get the patients to wear it, the, the, to keep them on, the nurses to, um, to put them on people. So that's a quality improvement initiative where you, you're disseminating with the best practices and you're using strategies to make sure that it happens. And then you um, monitor to make sure that you're really keeping up with what you were planning to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, maybe you've like made some improvements, but you're not quite where you want to be. You've, but you've gotten the people to wear the socks, but the falls are still happening. 
and there's no other evidence there that's going to support maybe a new intervention. So you decide to do a nursing research project. Um, so you might say, well, there's no information. We have all this information about socks, but what about non-stick, non-slip gloves? Maybe that's what we really, maybe that's where the problem could be solved. Let's put on, let's put non-slip um, gloves on people and see if that prevent falls. That's a new idea. It's a new hypothesis. We think that maybe that this will help. So we can put the gloves on the people, see if that affects our falls. We can also put the gloves on people and ask them how they feel about the gloves, um, mm -hmm. how the nurses feel about the gloves, um, which would be more of a qualitative approach. So um, that's taking one problem and really moving it through the different iterations between evidence-based practice, quality improvement, or research. Mm -hmm. I, I think one of the interesting things you pointed out at the very beginning of your example was um, the population piece. So I think that's really critical when you're looking at the evidence and how you're gonna implement it, um, or if you need to start something new, because maybe there is tons of evidence about putting uh, non-skid socks on adults, but maybe there is very little evidence uh, putting them on a pediatric patient population. And so you can have the same problem in different populations and have different levels of evidence that support your work. So I think the population piece is always very interesting. Yeah, for sure. And we definitely, in the Center for Nursing Inquiry, have more resources about evaluating what information does exist and then figuring out what's your next best step, next best step. should you do an EVP, a QI, or a research project based on our info, on the information that um, your sort of preliminary searches. Because like you said, there might be tons of evidence in um, ortho patients, but no evidence in peds oncology patients or things like that. Right. Great. Thank you for that example. I think falls is something most everybody can relate to. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, everybody's heard about them, at least. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, well, are there, uh, we don't really have anybody interacting with us presently since we are in virtual world this year. But if you do have questions about this topic that Maddie has covered very high level, um, please reach out to the Center for Nursing Inquiry because we are here to help and Maddie has a lot of great resources for people and a lot of great resources are available online. So we are very interested in hearing anything anybody has to say. And if you have questions, um, we are here to help. Maddie, thank you. Heather. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.